I want to introduce our speaker. Kay Renee Horton is the lead metallics and weld engineer for NASA's Space Launch System at the Michoud Assembly Facility, working on NASA's journey to Mars. Horton has a major role in building the rocket that will take astronauts to Mars. Having worked with NASA as a student, she began her career with them in 2012 and has since been awarded six Group Achievement Awards. In 2011, she became the first African American to earn a PhD in material science at the University of Alabama. She earned her bachelor's in electrical engineering with a minor in mathematics in 2002 from Louisiana State University. In 2016, she was elected president of the National Society of Black Physicists. She is the second woman to hold the office since our past president of AAAS, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson, was the first uh, president, who was the president of NSBP, not the first, uh, in 1983, 33 years ago. So please join me in welcoming Dr. K. Renee Horton. Well, born and raised in Louisiana. <laughs> I guess I really didn't need to come all the way to the mic. They gave me a mic. I was going to um, try to step up, and they told me I couldn't do that. I had to come up the walk. <laughs> but I was going to try. Um, I do want to say I want to thank you for giving me your time this evening. You could have been anywhere else, but you chose to be here at your table listening to me speak, and also here to present your research. It is probably my biggest honor when I'm allowed to speak to students because you are our future. And I'm not sure we really understood that when we were going to the conferences about being the future. We would go, we would hang out, we would get a chance to recharge, but none of us thought that we were sitting next to somebody who would be doing something, right? So what I want you to do is, I want you to take a look at those at your table, and you probably know them. But I want you to take a look at those that are sitting around you and behind you. Because they're going to be doing those breakthroughs that you just saw. And you're going to be able to say, I remember meeting them. They're going to be your friends and your colleagues. So, I'm going to call him out now and not at the end. Michael sends me a message. I'm here at the conference. I'm going to call him on up, and now I'm late. Getting down here, everybody all upset. But we went to, to college together. We did a grad program together, and he says he remembers me coming onto the campus with fire, with the desire to finish and want it. So I'm supposed to give a little tidbit on what you want, and I really do have a speech prepared, but you have to want it. You have to want it more than you want anything else sometimes. So that's the first bit I'm going to give you. My path to success. So my path is not a normal path. I started, got pregnant, dropped out, got married, got divorced, got pregnant again, Oh, I got pregnant one time in the marriage, too, so two pregnancies. Got another one, got three kids out of it, and then I went back to college. So that is my path in a nutshell. And I know you're looking like, well, what the world? <laughs> right? I liked being pregnant. No, 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 not really. <laughs> I just couldn't stop getting pregnant. <laughs> we were like rabbits or something, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, but they actually became my bigger my biggest driving force in life. I will move hell for those three. So who am I? I loved it. They brought up a physicist, that's me. They brought up an engineer, that's me. They brought up a mathematician, I have a minor in math. I fit all of those. I currently am working as either a systems engineer or a project management specialist with NASA. I'm currently serving as the president of the National Society of Black Physicists, and to date, 
that is my greatest honor to be serving during our 40th year anniversary. I serve as a mentor, and my most important accomplishment for me is the fact that I am a mother. So I really believe that this BS is bullshit sometimes, but BS is in electrical engineering from Louisiana State University, born and raised in Baton Rouge with a minor in math. Give it to me one time. There we go. Go Tigers. I'll take them too. <laughs> I have a PhD in material science from the University of Alabama with a concentration in physics. Y'all can do your own thing, but I am born and bred Louisiana and it will always be Go Tigers for me. But I am extremely proud of my education from the University of Alabama. The trials and tribulations and the obstacles that I faced at the University of Alabama made me ready for any and everything that they were going to throw at me in the workplace. Now, I am a diehard SEC fan, and when it comes to football, I chose the university simply because it was close to home and I would be able to make it back to the football game. It was before Saban came. After he came, I knew I needed to graduate. Another motivating factor to graduate. The thing is, I've always known that I wanted to work for NASA since I was a little bitty girl. My dad, we used to go on these family vacations, and we weren't rich, but we, my dad took us on a family vacation every single summer. And my uncle was in the Air Force, and that's in Biloxi, and we'd have to drive from Baton Rouge to Biloxi, and we would pass the Stennis Space Center. And outside of the Stennis Space Center at the rest stop, they have a, a, a lunar lander. And I'd always have to use the restroom, no matter what, when we got there. And it was so that I could go to the lunar lander. And my dad would say, you've got five minutes to pretend. My five minutes to pretend I was an astronaut. My five minutes to pretend I had discovered something amazing. We even got to the point where my dad would let me plant those little flags. They'd buy me a little flag to plant my little flag. They're not there now, so I don't know who keeps throwing them away. But, <laughs> but I get to plant my little flag. And I always wanted to work for NASA. So I told you, like in a nutshell, started school, dropped out. I actually started college at 16. At 17, don't clap yet, I told you I dropped out, God. So at 17, I found out I was hearing impaired. And my path, I had laid out this path. I was gonna be a pilot in the Air Force, and I was gonna become an astronaut. That was my path. I was gonna work for NASA. I didn't know anything else. When we played baby dolls, my grandmother had sewn Barbie a lab coat because she was going to be a scientist, too. That was all I knew. So when they told me that none of that was going to happen, I just kind of went all wild and crazy. Thus, the rabbiting started happening, right, in the kids. So got pregnant, had my son. We got married. We moved overseas to Germany. And I lived in Germany for three years. Amazing experience. Had my second son. We came back, things weren't working out, right? We got divorced, and then I had my daughter. Well, when she was born, they gave her to me with her eyes open. She wasn't like other, the other two. The other two came to me all sleeping. I had to force them to eat and everything, not her. She was looking at me like she wanted to hold a conversation, <laughs> right? And I was looking at her, and what it hit me was I needed to change the world for her. I wanted the world to be different for her. I wanted her to be able to do all those things people had closed the door on for me. I was going to relive my dream of being an astronaut through her. I was going to make her an astronaut now, right? That she's not. She's a broadcast major. But I looked at her, and I knew immediately I needed to go back to school to fulfill the potential that was inside of me so that her potential would not be stopped. I was going to be her role model. So when I went back to school, went back to LSU at this time, and finished through, 
when I got the NASA fellowship was for gra the graduate program. And I did three NASA, uh, three different NASA programs. The catch was I was starting to live my dream again. And so they talked about that energy that is always in the room, right? And I come in with like on a thousand every day, like I'm here, NASA. Like what you, what you got for me? Like I'm ready to do some research and I'm ready to do this. So when I started back for graduate school, I went through under a graduate student research program and that was for three years and it was out at Goddard Space Center. Then from there I went to the Harriet Jenkins program which was also a three year program. Now the catch about the Harriet Jenkins program is that you don't always get to meet the people your scholarship is named after. And Dr. Jenkins was still alive. She passed away recently. But she came to every conference that we had. The beauty of the conference was that, with that fellowship, was that we came in cohort of 20. And then the outgoing cohort pinned the incoming cohort. So you not only had your group, you had the next group that came behind them, the next group, and then the group that you pinned. So you had about 60 scientists that you were now able to collaborate with, able to keep up with to see what they're doing. So that was the beauty of the Jenkins Fellowship, on top of the fact that we got to see Dr. Jenkins every year. My last program with NASA was the NASA Leadership Academy. Now, mind you, I'm older. <laughs> And they put me in this academy with kids, I mean students, <laughs> that were two years older than my son. So I was real old compared to them. I was like almost old enough to be their mama. Well, a young mama, right? Because I was a young mama, but almost old enough to be their mama. So I was trying to be telling people what they was going to be doing in this program. Didn't work. Those kids took me skydiving white water rafting, hiking, and some other stuff. An amazing experience. I tell about the, and it's labeled NASA work, but I tell about the NASA experience because if I had not been open to new ideas, to new experiences, I would have never found the joy in those activities. I would have never created new colleagues who now I'm watching blossom and grow, who have reached out to say, what kind of projects can we do together? See, that's the beauty of being put into a situation that makes you uncomfortable. Lesson number two, do not shy away from things that make you uncomfortable. So my dissertation work is a doozy. I was doing physics at the University of Alabama, but I was going to NASA every summer. My advisor sent me an email and said, I am no longer want to be your advisor in May. He said, you, should need, you need to choose between your work between NASA and what I'm doing, and I don't think you really want to do my work. I was set to graduate December of that year, and I got the email in February. So I had one of two choices. I could cry about it, which I did, or I could figure out an answer to my problem. See, it wasn't his problem that he didn't want to be my advisor anymore. It was my problem that I didn't have an advisor, and I didn't have a master's, so I had no other choice but to get a PhD. I had already got all them loans, and I was going to need a job at some point to pay this stuff off. So I called a couple of my friends, my colleagues who I met through NSBP. We used to go to the annual conference every year with NSBP. And in that annual conference, we would rejuvenate, refuel our soul to go back and endure what was happening. See, I could stand up here and say that some of my colleagues had it easy, just went straight through, never even had anybody say anything racist to them at all. Never had anybody put up an obstacle, never had anybody close a door. I'm just not one of those. 
but it did not stop me from succeeding. And I'm doing very well, and now they all on Twitter talking about, that used to be my student. And I'd be like, mm-mm, don't say that now. You was mean to me at the university. But I wish I had hair. That was a hair flip moment, I think. <laughs> but I called one of my colleagues, and I said, this just happened. She said, OK. And then she told me her horror story. And then I called somebody else, and they told me their horror story. I heard like six of them, and I started to think, professors are really crazy, batshit crazy. Like, like, I don't want to be a professor now, because they crazy, and I don't want to go crazy, right? But I still had a problem. So what I did was I contacted those that I had worked with at NASA. And I said, hey, I need a dissertation. Can any of the work that I've previously done lead to anything? Do you have a problem that needs to be solved? I'm talking about something that you want some free labor for. So you gotta, gotta swing it, right? I was free labor at that point, right? I was like, I'm free labor. I know you got a problem that they won't let you work on, but I can, because I'm free labor. I kept saying free labor, just free labor, right? And one of the guys says, we do have a problem. He's from another country, so I'm faking his accent, right? So he said, we do have a problem, and that became my dissertation. So I went from being an engineer to minor in math to a physicist who was doing depositions and thin films to a friction stir weld engineer. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't know what I was going to be doing. Wasn't really sure how I was going to pull off my dissertation either. But what I did know was I needed a topic, I needed research and I was about to make this happen. Didn't come easy either. So I changed my topic, became a friction stir welder, and I was working around the clock, 12 to 15 hours, because not only did I have to get my research done, I also had to go back and learn all the back stuff. I'll tell you about good old NASA, though. They don't publish much. We keep everything secret. So there wasn't a whole lot in literature for me. I think maybe there was one other master's thesis for me to look at and pull from. And I was having to go to some of the other older guys and saying, I know you got some memos. So I was surfing through memos and emails and everything just to try to put everything together. Well, I'm good to go now, though, right? Ooh, I'm ready. I done set the defense date for December. It's going to happen because I'm ready to get out of school now. I'm running out of money. The kids want real food, right? They tired of eating ramen noodles and stuff like that. <laughs> Talking about you need to get a real job. How long you gonna be at school? You gonna ever be a doctor? You know, so I, was, I had a little pressure at the house now, right? <laughs> just, just a little bit. My daughter had packed up. I came home one day and she said, I no longer want to do your PhD. <laughs> I said, what? I, I no longer want to do your PhD. I'm moving. I was, wow, she's 12, she's moving. I said, you got your own place? I called my grandmother, and she gave me her room. <laughs> so needless to say, my daughter moved home that December to my mother's, because she was not interested in doing my PhD. So I was ready, right? I'm, this is going to happen. I was telling everybody, we, we going to graduate. We, the whole team go, we got this, right? Well, shuttle ran into a problem in December. I was supposed to defend. Just like anything else, everything else shut down. Everything. All resources were now moved to get shuttle off the pad. Because you're losing millions of dollars every day shuttle is sitting on the pad. Or was, because we ended that program. So, Everything shut down. The catch was, I couldn't shut down. So I got to work with the team. I was very honored because as a student, they still allowed me to work with the team to be able to get shuttle off the pad during the day. And at night, when all of those guys left after a 10-hour shift, I still worked maybe three or four hours because I had to work on the off shift to get the work to be able to use the equipment. So I was really putting in about 16 hours a day. 
and then I'd go home and I'd sleep and then I'd get up and I'd do it all again. By this time, I had abandoned the boys. I had left them in their own house down there and my daughter had moved and I was living in Huntsville and they were in Tuscaloosa, so we were actually separated for a while. Well, we got through shuttle flu. I finally defended in April 25th. So that day has some significance. I defended, I'm good to go. Professor was like, you knocked it out the park. We're just going to do a little rewriting, and we're going to rewrite it together because y'all wrote it in this very technical style. We're going to write it in dissertation style. Didn't even know what that meant, but I was game, right? I'm down. You say show up, I'm here. Two hours, he'd go through, and I was like, I got to be the dumbest thing in the world. Every time he give me a chapter back, it got 992 red marks. But it was style, right? He wanted it one way, the other professor had written it another way. Two days after I defended, the biggest tornado Tuscaloosa, Alabama has ever seen hit the city. People died. People I knew died. We lost homes. By the grace of God, my family was okay. It also meant I wasn't graduating in May. <laughs> so I'm a little upset about that one. Didn't graduate in May. Finally, I graduate in August. I'll tell you what I didn't do with any of this. I did not even look for a job. So I graduated in August, August 5th, 2011. I was 39 years old. I was going to turn 40 in October. I ain't have no job. I ain't have no house. I was going to lose my storage with all my stuff in it. I had to move me my son, who is a nerve-wrecking individual, and my daughter, who was already living at my mother's, right? Now, we all got to move into my mama's house. My mother is a comedian. Every single morning, she would get up, and she would say, hey, doc, from downstairs to upstairs, right? Hey, doc. And I'd say, yes, ma'am. She said, did you find a job last night? I say, no, ma'am. She said, well, good. I got a list of errands for you. And your daddy wants some white beans today, so can you cook up the pot? So I did that for three months, actually. And I'm very grateful that she actually did that. So the work that they ended up giving me was the um, conventional, I worked on conventional stir welding and then self-reacting stir welding. The self-react, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but the self-reacting stir welding is the one that NASA actually uh, created within our facility up at Marshall. So it was really interesting to be able to see that and then start looking on it. And I actually looked at the movement of the material between the welded plates, and it was with dissimilar alumina. We had been welding with same type aluminas on the both sides, and now it's with dissimilar alumina. That's about as far as I'm going to go with that. So after graduation, three months of living in Mama's, Ooh, five minutes. I ain't even, oh, Lord. All right, so I got a job at a rope company, and this rope company kept telling me it's not rocket science, right? I barely made 90 days there before they let me go. They said I wasn't a good fit for the company. Yes, you can be fired and be okay. Do not stay somewhere that you're not really wanted or that doesn't feel good to you. All right, so I'm a full-time employee. I got to go through this real fast. got five minutes. I got to work on hardware. It was the first time I had gotten to work on hardware, and it was the first time NASA had produced hardware in more than 30 years at the facility. So within six months of being there, I got to work this particular program, got to put my name on it. So I wanted to go to space. They told me I couldn't go to space. My name went to space a year and a half after I got to NASA. I currently work on the Space Launch System. It's the biggest rocket ever built that NASA has ever built. It's the, we will go the furthest we've ever gone, and it's the most powerful thing rocking on this Earth. It, the engine's power equals 160,000 Corvette engines. Core stage, which is the centerpiece of that rocket, is actually produced at Michoud in New Orleans. This is my team right in the center. These guys celebrated breast cancer awareness with me. This is the Vertical Assembly Center. The Vertical Assembly Center is the largest well tool in the world. It stands 170 feet tall. It is the only one of its kind. My very first job when I got down to Mishu was to oversee bringing this tool online. It didn't work in October. We found out that they had mistranslated some numbers. These guys are Swedes. We're Americans. Millimeters and inches are not the same. <laughs> I also oversee the Gore tool. 
the circumferential well tool, which is the one at the bottom, and also the one that makes our barrels. I have the pleasure of being the person who does all the metals and wells. I oversee all of that activity at the plant. That's 90% of my rocket. Bolts, flanges, panels, all of it. And I didn't really truly understand how amazing that was until Hidden Figures came out. That a little black girl that sat on the roof of her house <laughs> with a telescope at night looking for the stars would be the final authority signature in a room. So I had some history to go through, but I only had five minutes, and now I probably got two. But we're celebrating our 40th year anniversary. You please go to our website, nsvp.org. Our history is on the website. You can also become a lifetime member for $1,250. You can divide that into 10 payments, four payments, nine payments, five payments, however you like. It's only good for this year. We're trying to get 40 of us to become lifetime members for the 40th year. History, go to the website for that, though. Dr. H, I'm supposed to tell all this good stuff. It's not going to happen. This is Dr. H. Dr. H was conceived from my brain. It's the kid inside of me who makes me happy. She makes me happy. She gets to do all the stuff that I wish I could do, right, without getting in trouble. She also believes in diversity. So those are Dr. H's real friends on this picture. These are two books that are coming out this, this year, Dr. H Explores the Universe and Dr. H and Her Friends. These are my mentees. I don't have the pleasure, like Michael, raise your hand, Michael, woo -hoo. right there, that's my buddy. He teaches in the university, so he gets to mentor in the university. I don't teach in the university, so I started my own mentoring program. These are my mentees. And this is me from my photo shoot. <laughs> but those are my kids and my new grandbaby. Yeah, all it up. And he's so smart already, he's two months, and we be reading him out the digital electronic book, and he just be so happy. <laughs> all right, so I done got to the questions. Uh, this is my information that you can contact me. I'm pretty good about answering email within three or four or five days. <laughs> you can always call. If you tweet, if you took a picture, tag me. Open for questions. Thank you. I mean, I don't, everybody runs to the mic at once. <laughs> they shy? Oh, my goodness. Is this thing on? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, Monique Farrell, um, PhD, Material Science and Engineering. So I haven't fully formulated the question, but I think I would like to ask, I know you mentioned a couple of times that you were working on something totally new. How did you convince them to let you start working on it? So you have to convince people that they need it. It's not really about you at that point. And so when I went to NASA, I really went with the, you, let me know what you need. I want to work on the what you need. And then, you know, at first I got some stuff, and I was like, that's not what I want to do. So I kind of went back and I was like, well, you know, I was thinking, what if we did, and then this and that, and then it was kind of like a give and take, back and forth, and then we kind of came up with the project that was right in the middle that satisfied both of us. Okay, okay. So, and then I guess the next part of that is, after you talk about your transferable skills and what they need, do you, did you ever still have some type of resistance between, you know, this is not really your background, this is not really, you know, where we've seen you in the past, what your resume has stated. Did you just kind of like go to the top, start talking to people, getting uh, different people on board, and then that's how you can keep Oh, going? see, you have to get you a sponsor, love. Mm. You gotta get you somebody who can get you in the door, yeah. right? 
You got to sell that one person. One. You only really need one. But he can't be on the same level as you. He, can't, he has to be somebody who can get you in the door. Mm -hmm. So you find you a sponsor. And there's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. A sponsor is someone who's going to sponsor you into the boardroom or sponsor you into the, the room when you need to get into the room. So you need to convince that person. And then you really probably need to do your research. There used to be this thing like a cloud thing, and you could punch things in, and it would kind of give you other words to say that these skills, are, you know, to say mm -hmm. that these skills mm -hmm. are the other skills that you have. So that's something that you got to really look at is take the skills that you do have, look at what it is you want to do, and really match those things together. So when you are selling yourself, you are really selling them based on what they wanted to begin with anyway. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Emily Oshida. I'm from Fayetteville State University. Um, your story is identical to my own story, except you have the strength to uh, pursue dreams that I didn't. And that's my question for you, is as a mother, as someone who went to school and then went back to school, how did you have that strength? How are you here? <laughs> that's a good question. I'm curious. <laughs> My uh, oldest son would, you know, when I got really weak, and I got weak a lot of times, but it really was my network. I had an amazing network that when it just, when I thought I just couldn't keep going, that I, I could turn to them, and they could give me that push that I actually needed. And my network was not just people like my family. It was colleagues that I met. It was mentors. It was me approaching people saying, can I just add you to my list? Because, see, there are days where I get up and I can't go forward. Or you, you get days like that? All the time. Baby, I'm going <laughs> to give you my personal number, right? I'm going to give you my personal number, so make your way up here, right, when you finish crying. Thank you. Don't come up here crying, though. No. Don't do cry, <laughs> all right? And I'm going to give you that. And when you need that, you just text me and you say, how did you do it? I just need to get through the day. And what people have a misunderstanding is, it's not about getting through the whole semester at one time. Sometimes it was really me just getting through the hour. And then I got through the hour, and then it may be, OK, I could get through to lunch. OK, I'm going to get past that. Are you doing self-care days? You need to, you, you got to schedule in. I saw you shake your head, but you got to schedule in self-care days. Even if it's one or two a semester. And a self-care day is where you really don't care about nothing but you. Right? Not even them kids. They can eat ramen noodles. They are not going to die. I tell you. Because mine is still They greasy. love ramen. I'm glad. <laughs> but that, we can continue to talk. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Um, hello, my name is Aaliyah Shank, and I go to North Carolina Central University. I have been looking at programs um, in material science, and I found out that I might be one of the first African-American women to go through this PhD program. So, <laughs> so my thing, I'm a chem I have a chemistry background, and my main question was, what are some of the trials and tribula tribulations that you went through, and how did you overcome them? So my trials and tribulations had less to do with the coursework, because I knew I was smart enough to do that, right? My trials and tribulation really was the fact that, see, once they put that label on you, the first, you start carrying the weight of the whole entire African-American community on your shoulder. See, you can't fail now, because if you fail, you may close the door for somebody else. And you don't want to do that, do you? And that's the way I felt every day going to, going to class. So I failed part of my qualifier, and the janitor told me I failed. I didn't even get, I hadn't even gotten the email yet. I got to the school, and the janitor said, we so sorry. <laughs> and I said, what? They said, you didn't pass your qualifier. Well, damn, thank you. I didn't know what else to say. You know, I didn't know what else to say. Everybody knew it. My janitors were black, right? Everybody knew it. Everybody knew when I passed as well, though. 
right? And so they were always the ones, there were always people who were willing to, to support you and that kind of thing. Um, the qualifiers was a, very, was a difficult time for me because I had children. So in studying, I actually had to pack up and move into a hotel for four days right before qualifiers so that I could kind of study on my own schedule. To me, that and then my professor deciding he didn't want to be my professor anymore were my biggest, were my biggest obstacles for me. Thank you. Did I get everything for you? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, Donald White, Tuskegee University, PhD student in material science and engineering. Woohoo! So it looks like um, before I got up here, I stayed up here for like four or five minutes. Everybody took all my questions. But, Dr. Don't try H to take my spotlight. Get to your question. No, no, I'm asking. <laughs> but what I wanted to ask you was how did you accomplish, because you got a pretty colorful background, I have one as well, and um, how did you accomplish? Uh, the, the rigors of being a parent, because I'm also one, and school, that's a heavy duality. Oh, right? man. So when, we, when I went back to undergrad my first semester, I was trying to be normal, right? I was still going to family functions, hanging out, trying to club, and everything wasn't working. <laughs> did not work. I didn't do so good that first semester. I was like, what did I do wrong? I'm smart. I got this under control. Them mm -hmm. kids sleep at night, everything, right? Right. I had to remove everything except school and family. We had a calendar on the wall. If it was not put on the calendar on Saturday or Sunday for the week, we didn't do it. People couldn't call me up and say, can you come do something on two? Oh, that's not on the calendar. <laughs> and we, went, we had a very, very rigid schedule during the week. Weekends was a little bit different. But during the week, it was a very, very rigid schedule. And we did that through undergrad, which was two years straight. I went fall, summer, intercession, intercession, and spring. So I went you know, year round for undergrad. But it was a very, very strict schedule, and we stayed to that. It got a little bit better by the time we got to graduate school, because my son started driving. And so he could get himself around. And then my brother um, packed up and moved to Alabama and became my nanny. <laughs> so my, my younger brother, well actually he's not even really my brother, I kind of adopted him, but he actually packed and moved and became my nanny, so my daughter still calls him Nanny Joe. But he was actually there, but we still went through like a, a rigid schedule. And what you have to remember is, because the kids are not in school and the, the wife or your girlfriend or whatever it may be, your significant other may not be in school, they may not really get that pressure. You have to communicate that though. You can't just be all stressed out and freaked out. You actually have to communicate. Look, I'm under this deadline. I've got this extra stress right now. You know, I'm not going to be able to do, I'm not going to be able to go to the ballet with you. I'm not going to be able to see the dance routine. Or can you, if you do this, I'm willing to do this. Because she's going to need a break as well, right? So if you're willing to let me get through this, then you can have your Sarah. You're going to have to make sacrifices that are going to be bigger than you. Thank it's you. only for a little bit. Good evening, Dr. Horton. Good uh, evening. My name is Lewis Lott. I'm a graduate student from Delaware State University, a uh, second year master's student. And my question for you is, how did you go about reaching that, um, to receive help from um, uh, other, other professors when, when you lacked uh, an advisor yourself when it, when it came crunch time? Can you repeat it one more time? Yes, ma'am. Um, how did you go about reaching out to receive help from other advisors um, at the point when your advisor uh, stopped, uh, or stopped uh, giving you help at, at the last point of your semester? Actually, I went to the uh, chair of the department. Yes, ma'am. Told him the situation. And he said, well, we can't make people do stuff, which is true. So I said, well, would you be willing to facilitate a conversation with other advisors? For me. And he gave me some names and he sent the original email saying that this student is looking for, you know, someone because the, the original, we never did say who the advisor was, right? The original advisor is no, no longer willing to go forward. And so I went to the, cha uh, the chair of the physics department and the chair of the engineering department because my work could have gone in either one. Right. And asked them and they facilitated the conversation for me. Okay. All right. Does that Thank answer you. it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, thank you. You having that problem? Yeah, actually, yes, We're going to talk. Catch me. We're going to talk. Okay, thank All you. Right. 
Jamie, that's two. That's supposed to be two. <laughs> Uh, I don't know who came first. Is a lady? Oh, he's pointing at the lady. All right. He's a gentleman. Okay. My name is Akia Pope, and I talking attend, to the mic for me. I attend Harris Bell State University. Um, I wanted to ask you about two different things. How did you deal with social media when you were? Girl, trying I just to told you I was. Oh, it ain't we in no real social media. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you were talking about Mars. I wanted to know about going to Mars and how they were, yeah. I want to know how far along are you in the process? Oh, girl. And get me really excited. What can um, America All right, I'm going to do social media first because that's going to be a show. Social media didn't really come along until toward the end of my, my time in school, so it wasn't that big one. But what I do know is one of my mentees um, that was on there, she's now a professor at UGA, and social media was a big thing for her. She got off of it. Like, she disappeared for like a year. We were like, what is going on? Like, you're not on Facebook no more, right? She actually got off of it. She stopped dealing, the, the dealing with it altogether. So I, I don't know in what way are you saying, like with social media or? Just you answer my question because I feel like I have a problem, so I should delete Girl, it. Girl, if you have identified the problem, <laughs> You didn't, that's the first step in recovering alcoholic. <laughs> I thought you might tell me that, hey, it's okay, you can just use it on the weekends. But. No, 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 <laughs> no. She actually got off altogether. Um, during her time, she was writing, finishing up her research, and she's a, she was a single mom, but she got off of it altogether. Because what she said was there was a lot of people still being negative, right? And when you allow negativity into your space, it depletes your positive energy. Well, you can't get things done when you're running on empty, right? So if you know you have a problem with Facebook, you might want to limit it to four days a month, not a week, a month. <laughs> like, you make it your reward, right? It becomes a milestone. I was in the lab this many hours. I got this done. I have earned social media this Saturday. And you guys laugh, but I'm, a, I'm an adult most days. My boss sometimes says, who came to work, the kid or the adult? Because I'm just full of energy, and I'm going to tell you about Mars in a minute, too. And, but I have to still set those milestones for myself. I have to earn things. I have to earn, you know, if I haven't been productive, then I don't get to do some of those things that are cheap fun. Facebook and social media is just cheap fun. So if you got a problem, <laughs> You're going to be a recovering alcoholic. We got you, girl. All right. So Mars, they wanted to know how far we are going to Mars. We were currently set to fly in 2018. I think we're going to fly in 2019. NASA still says 2018. Um, we are currently building the rocket. We do have flight hardware that is already in the facility. The facility was recently hit by a tornado, uh, I guess maybe about three weeks now. It's been about three weeks it was hit with a tornado. We had no damage to any of our hardware. But we, do have we did have damage to the facility itself, which that has delayed us some. The trip to Mars is set for 2025 or 2028 is when the trip to Mars is set. The first trip that we'll take, the exploratory mission will be um, the same elliptical path that the Earth actually takes, and so it'll be the furthest that we've ever gone. So that's going to be our first step in heading to Mars. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Joshua Dawson. I'm an undergraduate at the University of Washington in Seattle studying cell and molecular biology. And first of all, thank you for sharing your story. But uh, my question revolves around the idea of giving back. Who inspired you to really start giving back? And then as undergraduates, as high school students, graduates, oftentimes like, our schedules doing like, these conferences and everything can be really busy. But what's the biggest thing we can do with our current, like, in undergrad and high school to really start giving back? Our communities because sometimes it feels like we have to wait to get on stage and inspire people through these conferences as keynotes but what can we do in your opinion what can you do at the conference I just want to make sure I understood that. no like just in our communities like what's the biggest thing we can do to really inspire students to pursue stuff like stem oh okay got it all right yeah. so uh, what was my inspiration to make me go back was the first question correct uh, really to go back and even being uh, like being an astronaut, when you're a little girl, like what was the initial catalyst for you to hold on to like being an, an astronaut, even though that wasn't exactly what you did? You were still like inspired to do so in some way. So my daughter pushed me to go back. 
the inspiration to keep going, and especially to pursue STEM, was just the basic joy of knowledge. So you can be a scientist, and you can do stuff that don't even have an outcome, ever. And you can just keep researching and researching. That's the part about physics, too. You can keep researching and researching, and no application ever comes out of it. I was a true lover of knowledge and wanting to know and that kind of thing. So that kept me going. As undergraduates, it's going to be important to get your face out there. See, they see me, and I'm older, and they're like, oh, OK. If I didn't have the cool cartoon character, I don't know how well I'd go over with kids. But for the younger faces out there, they're looking like, oh, well, he's not that much older, or she's not that much older than me. I can do that, too. So get your face out there. Use social media, not the addict, though. Use social <laughs> media to get your face out there. Create you a profile that actually talks about STEM. Post those things. Do those workshops. Go into your churches, the schools. Just ask them to do those things and get that out there that this actually can be fun. I think we're, we're yeah, being cut you. off. <laughs> Uh, oh, two more. Okay, two more, two more. Right. Hi, I'm Taylor Ribeiro from the Norfolk State University. Um, I wanted to know, as a black woman in STEM, how did you get through the door and show them you were about business without giving off that angry black woman or, you know, attitude vibe? Girl, I done gave that off too many times. <laughs> <laughs> that is not my forte, and I don't know how to filter that all the time, right? My thing is, you either want what I have or you don't. You either going to allow me to give it and be 100%, or you may lose out. See, I'm excited about hidden figures coming out, because I'll be like, y'all was not going to get to the moon without that lady. <laughs> so I be telling them now, y'all might not get to Mars without me. You better watch yourself. <laughs> but that is. That is a real question, right? That is, a, that is a real question. And I've had to get up and call some folks sometimes in the middle of a meeting sometimes and be like, oh, Lord, it done rose up in me. I'm about to tell these folk off. And then she, Jamie be like, oh, don't do that. You like your job. Don't do that. <laughs> but it is one of those things that you just, you have to learn to read a room. You have to learn to read the people that you work with. The guys I work with, I work with a group that are older white guys and then one young white guy, right? Well, the white guy listens to more rap than me, so he good on, on that end, right? <laughs> but the older white guys, like, they ain't playing that angry stuff. Don't be coming here mad about nothing, because their wives are not mad. <laughs> no. So you have to learn how to work the room. See how all y'all laughing? All y'all happy with me right now. They might even pay me one day, but anyway. <laughs> You have to learn to work the room, right? And you have to learn to rechannel that and get you some good scientific girlfriends that you could go outside and call on the phone and say all that stuff you wish you had said. Then you walk back in the room and handle your business. Because see, at the end of the day, it's about handling your business. OK, thank you. Oh, Lord, somebody else can pop up back up. OK, last, we can only take last the question. one lady, and then I will find you, and I'll answer yours. Last question. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kaima Ma. I go to Delaware State University. I'm a senior. I'm graduating in May. And um, just like you, I have, I'm a double major and a minor. So I'm engineering in physics, and I'm also engineering dealing with optics, and my minor is mathematics. So. Um, going about everything because I'm graduating and uh, <laughs> I'm applying to different jobs and I'm coming across the problem that the jobs that people offer me is not the job that I want or the job that I apply for. So <laughs> I was wondering if you ever had that problem because it's you go fool really around frustrating. You're going to be unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> Baby, I took a rope job. <laughs> I was making synthetic rope. Do you really think that was the job I wanted? <laughs> No, it was not. But you still need to be able to work, right? Mm -hmm. And just because it's not the job that you want at the moment doesn't mean that that's where you have to stay. You can either keep looking. I mean, if your mom and them got a basement or an extra bedroom, you good. Well, I ain't going home. <laughs> <laughs>
You got it. But if not, you might need to take a job with it and keep it in your mind that you are always looking for your exit mm -hmm. to go to another place. There is nothing wrong with starting and leaving. Right. Okay, that is the last question. That was the last question. Thank you. My turn. Yes, ma'am. <laughs>